Transition metal complexes display a variety of properties. Most complexes are colored. Some have magnetic properties. These and other properties of transition metal complexes can be explained by the way in which the ligands are bonded to the metal. Crystal field theory is a model used to describe the way in which metals are bonded to ligands. It therefore describes the electronic structure of coordination complexes. In crystal field theory, the metal and ligands are considered to be point charges. The metal is a positively charged cation. The ligands are either negatively charged anions or neutral molecules with a negative pole at one end. For example, ammonia is a neutral molecule, but there is a lone pair of electrons on a nitrogen atom. This lone pair makes that end of the molecule delta negative, so it would be attracted to a positive metal cation. Now remember that transition metal complexes can adopt different geometries. For instance, complexes with six monodentate ligands usually adopt the octahedral geometry. Complexes with four monodentate ligands would most commonly adopt either a tetrahedral or a square planar geometry. Crystal field theory can be used to describe the bonding in each of these types of complexes. The bonding in each would differ slightly. In this lecture, however, we will only be focusing on the way in which crystal field theory is applied to octahedral complexes. Remember that in octahedral complexes, we have the metal bonded to six ligands. In crystal field theory, it is convenient to place the metal cation at the meeting point of an imaginary X, Y, and Z axis. The X, Y, and Z axes are shown here such that the Z axis is on the plane of the computer screen. The X and Y axes are coming out from behind the screen. The three axes are all perpendicular to each other. And the metal cation is placed at a point where all three axes intersect. At the beginning, the ligands are far away from the metal. Remember that ligands carry a negative charge. It is assumed that the ligands would approach the metal directly along the X, Y, and Z axes. In an isolated metal ion, the five d orbitals would be would all be at the same energy level.
Now remember, we said that the ligands are negatively charged. Each of the six ligands would have an electric field surrounding them. So each of the six ligands would have their own negative field surrounding them. But when they all come together around a metal cation, they effectively form a spherical field around the metal. For our purposes, we will define the barycenter as the center of this spherical field. So the d orbitals of the metal would be located at the barycenter. Now let us compare the energies of the d orbitals of the free metal ion and the d orbitals at the barycenter. Remember we said that the d orbitals of the free metal ion are degenerate. A spherical field results when the negatively charged ligands surround the metal. As the ligands get closer to the metal, that sphere is contracting towards the metal. As the sphere contracts, it gets smaller, but it also gets more intense. The electrons in the orbitals will be repelled by this negative field, and this repulsion will cause the energy of the orbitals to rise, but rise equally. So, at the barycenter, the orbitals are high in energy, but still degenerate. Now to represent this process in a diagram, we first indicate the energy axis. The energy arrow shown here indicates that as you move up, energy increases. We can use a simple line to represent each of the orbitals. We place the five lines side by side to show that the orbitals are degenerate. If these are the orbitals of the free metal cation, then the orbitals at the barycenter of the field would be higher in energy. So we place them higher up. Remember, the orbitals at the barycenter are also degenerate. To show that the free metal orbitals increases in the energy at the barycenter, we simply use a dotted line to connect them as shown. So on the left, we have the lower energy orbitals of the free metal cation. And on the right, we have the orbitals at the barycenter of the spherical field. Now remember that we said that as the field contracts towards the metal, the orbital at the barycenter rises equally in energy. But when the ligands get very close to the metal, say within bonding distance, the stronger repulsions between the negatively charged ligands and the electrons in the orbitals causes the orbitals to lose their degeneracy. That is, some orbitals move to a higher energy level and some move to a lower energy level compared to where they were at the barycenter. At the point where the d orbitals loses its degeneracy, the spherical negative electric field is now called a crystal field. Now let us see how we represent this process using a diagram.
Remember we said that the orbitals at the barycenter of the spherical field are degenerate. In the crystal field, two of these orbitals move to a higher energy level and three of them moves to a lower energy level. The two orbitals at higher energy are at the same energy level. These are the dz squared and dx squared minus y squared orbitals. The three orbitals at lower energy are degenerate as well. These three are the dxy, dxz, and dyz orbitals. In the crystal field, the orbitals are given symmetry labels, e.g. and T2g. It is also convenient to show the relative energy of the former barycenter, so we draw a dotted line to represent that in the crystal field. In part two of this video lecture series, we will examine why particular orbitals move to higher or lower energy levels in the crystal field.